what will happen to Hong Kong in 2047. Let's talk about it, but first hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so you stay educated on how your money works. As Hong Kong's protests took a deadly violent turn these past years, the question looms, what will happen on July 1st, 2047? The date marking 50 years since Britain handed over Hong Kong to China will also see the legal expiration of the One Country, Two Systems experiment that guarantees the former colony's autonomy. Negotiated by Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, it commits Beijing to ensuring political and economic freedom to the people of Hong Kong. So maybe we should talk about it now. Is 2047 the end date of the two systems or what? That question has fueled the dramatic protests that have been raging for the past few years turning one of Asia's premier financial hubs into a battleground featuring tear gas volleys, gas bombs, vandalism, roadblocks, and subway shutdowns. The demonstrations were sparked by a bill allowing extraditions to China and expanded to include demands for universal suffrage, a promise that is yet to be fulfilled after the 1997 handover. All of the unrest is really about Hong Kong's future. Can the city retain its freedom of the press and assembly, its English common law legal system, its low tax rate, and open market? Up to now, this is what kept Hong Kong one of the most business-friendly economies on the planet distinct from China. Whether it can stay that way is a bellwether for China's rise and how it will coexist with the West. Despite the crucial nature of the transition, conversations with current and former officials in Hong Kong suggest there have been no official discussions about what will happen in 2047. For many, it's way beyond for them to consider. But for many young people, that's only 16 years away. The past decade showed exactly how China wants things to go. Beijing has blocked a path to meaningful Hong Kong elections, banned pro-independence politicians, and undermined the independence of the judiciary. At the same time, it installed an immigration checkpoint downtown at a high-speed rail connecting China and Hong Kong. They've also built a bridge linking the city with Macau and the mainland, and they created a sweeping plan known as the Greater Bay Area to integrate Hong Kong's economy with southern China. Many of these things see this as good for Hong Kong since it helps the overall economy. However, this larger connectivity will further marginalize Hong Kong. In recent years, it's becoming harder to separate Hong Kong's political autonomy from its economic strengths. Many of the young people driving the protests who will be middle-aged in 2047 see the freedoms they now enjoy as incompatible with China's political system. That includes widespread controls on the internet, the use of technology like facial recognition to clamp down on dissent, and re-education camps for hundreds of thousands of minority Muslims in the western regions of China. The reasons for the protests now, because in 2047, their freedom will become nothing in Hong Kong. That's why they go out in the streets and tell the government what they're thinking today. And they're not alone. The city overwhelmingly sympathizes with the goals of the protesters as seen by the hundreds of thousands of black clad demonstrators who have flooded the streets month after month. Pro-democracy candidates have won 85% of seats in the past year in an election for local district council, a huge embarrassment for officials in Beijing. But right now, China's leadership has the final say over Hong Kong's election for chief executive, and it has ruled out any demands that it will allow the city to vote in a leader that stands up to Beijing. That raises the prospect of years of unrest in Hong Kong if the students driving the movement continue to fight. The unresolved political conflict has deeply shaken the business community as well. Capital has started flowing out as tourist arrival and retail sales plummet, pushing Hong Kong into its first recession since the global financial crisis, and it's made even worse due to the pandemic, which has accelerated Hong Kong's dwindling economic importance to Beijing when compared with other mainland cities. In the year 2000, Hong Kong accounted for 40% of China's overall economy. Today, it's about 8%. Prior to the unrest, many business groups also opposed the extradition bill over fears that executives in Hong Kong could be snatched away and forced to stand trial in courts beholden to the Communist Party. Last March, the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong warned that the proposed arrangements will reduce the appeal of Hong Kong to international companies. Internationally, China's encroachment on Hong Kong has prompted powerful lawmakers to question the city's unique economic privileges. This led to the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which strengthened provisions that tied the city's preferential tariffs to its political autonomy. At the time of the handover, the 50-year plan was designed to give China a chance to catch up to Hong Kong, whose economy is ranked the freest in the world by the Heritage Foundation. And it's still a long way off. China's per capita GDP puts the country roughly in line with Mexico and Lebanon, while Hong Kong is more on par with Germany or Canada. So for now, Beijing has good reason to maintain two systems. Nearly 60% of China's outbound investments is channeled through Hong Kong, putting it ahead of Shenzhen and Shanghai. 
it continues to be an important source of IPO fundraising for mainland firms and bond issuance for a significant source of funds for Chinese corporations. And international companies also like Hong Kong, even with the unrest. Incredibly low tax rates, a cap of 17% on individuals in Hong Kong, compared with as much as 45% on the mainland, have also made it an irresistible place for global businesses to profit from China's rise, all with the protection of an independent judiciary. But as 2047 gets closer, businesses will want certainty about what happens next. The older generation can still recall the financial turmoil that began almost 20 years ahead of the official handover. Between 1982 and 1983, the Hong Kong's currency lost 25% of its value, culminating on Black Saturday with an all-time low of $9.80 Hong Kong dollars to the US dollar. People will then have to work on the assumption that the reason there's no commitment from China is because they plan to apply mainland law to Hong Kong, full integration. The cost of doing that could be tremendous, not least due to the fears businesses would have of coming under Chinese legal jurisdiction. It would also entail a host of practical changes that would take years of transition to avoid catastrophe, from monetary policy, taxes and capital movement to passports, visa rules and customs procedures. But others see a more incremental way forward. Beijing wants to preserve the best of Hong Kong. And that best is the rule of law, the common law system, not democratic elections. But either way, Beijing has little incentive to make radical changes. They already have plenty of power, because they can change the Hong Kong system at will. So what are your thoughts? Is China's one country, two systems experiment over in 2047? Leave a comment down below and let's get a discussion started. And as always, take care of your money.